um, experienced one of the most uh, severe dictatorships, communist dictatorships mm -hmm. in for more than 40 years. Um, we were liberated by the Italian takeover in 44. And soon after the communists took over, Albania was extremely poor. And so there were very few wealthy people uh, or landlords. And so there was quite a bit of um, popular support for taking over, confiscating the property of the few wealthy and spreading it over to everybody else. Uh, during this period, everything got confiscated, all property, um, everything, stores, any kind of private en enterprise, um, all, all homes, <laughs> uh, ranches, land, anything got, got confiscated, as was gold as well. Um, my family wasn't wealthy, but my aunt married into a wealthy family. They were merchants. They had houses, ranches, stores. Everything was gone in an instant. Everything was taken over. Um, they were, however, able to um, hide their gold. And they survived for the next 40 plus years as a family with that gold. Um, a few years ago, my aunt actually gave me one of those pieces of gold that I wear oh, wow. as a necklace. It's, um, it's a French franc from the uh, 19th century. And it's a constant reminder that gold has always been money and was pretty much the only way for them to, for this particular family to survive and also hold on to some of their wealth. Um, after the uh, communist rule um, was basically over in 1991, um, a lot of former, a lot of people who owned land were able, or, or houses or real estate were able to get it back. But this particular family that I know of has spent 30 years in lawsuits, right? To little by little take some of that property back. It's, so in other words, there may be disruptions that will result in loss of, say, pro um, real property, but getting it back is not necessarily easy. Right. And so um, during the time that gold was confiscated, it was, it was pretty much illegal to own, trade. Um, however, there was, um, there was uh, sort of an underground economy. Black that market. Was, Black market mm -hmm. that was pervasive pretty much in all of the Eastern Bloc countries. And mm -hmm. so uh, jewelry was not illegal. So um, a lot of people melted the gold, you know, went to a jeweler, melted it, turned it into jewelry, and then sold it. So that was one way to convert it into the currency. Uh, and again, black market, right? Um, so it was... Um, <laughs> it was a very interesting time, obviously, that right. surpassed... <laughs> anybody's expectations in terms of how bad it could get and um yeah they thought it couldn't happen here right i mean right. that's always the way people think where they'll say oh well maybe it can happen over there but you know this is this is just impossible to happen here and it happened very gradually like so for example when the communists took over they didn't just take everything from everybody. They took everything from the few rich ones and, and spread the wealth around. So all Good of the small point. farmers got a piece of land. They were working for the landlord before, and now they got a piece of land to work on it themselves. And so um, everyone basically supported that, right? <laughs> At right. least the majority supported right. that. It made sense. Now we have, so, but this, equalization of the means didn't really result in the equalization of the outcomes. People who worked harder, obviously, <laughs> um, ended up with more, and that was not good enough. And so the regime decided, no, we're going to equalize the outcomes too. So in the 70s, they took over the entire land. They basically got rid of all private enterprise and private property. Uh, it, it was made illegal. You could not run a business <laughs> out of your home or anywhere else. Uh, you couldn't own land. You couldn't own anything. And so when they took over all of the land and they became the owner, now all of the farmers had to work in the government land, the government enterprise. And it may not, like, that's how they erase all incentives for 
uh, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. creativity, for working hard, right? If, if you're going to make just as much as the next guy, why, why work harder than the next guy, right? Right. And so this race to the bottom <laughs> really <laughs> characterized uh, the last 20 years of the dictatorship, as well as um, what the inevitable um, shortages that happen, right? Shortages in food and and, and well, you, you may, I want to talk more about the food shortages because food does become the biggest issue for most people during these transitions. Uh, yeah. But you also made a really interesting statement and you're talking about the real property. So land, which is immovable and therefore it's much easier to confiscate and it's much because you can't put it on your back and walk away with it. But uh, yeah. your family member had gold. And so they were, and you can't hide land either. I mean, it's there. Right. <laughs> right. So, uh, but they were able to do that with gold and then survive for 40 years on that real money that they got to hide. And I think exactly. it's also interesting that jewelry was not confiscated, right? Maybe because it's a collectible. And I wonder if other collectibles might not have also been not confiscated. I guess it, it, it was traditional for people to, um, when at least there was a wedding or an engagement to gift jewelry and wear jewelry. And so I think that was the reason why maybe like a traditional, I think that, that would have been very hard to break. I was going to say, yeah, I mean, India has been trying to do that forever. And so that might have been a push too hard because the last thing any government wants is a revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, I think there was quite a bit of like affinity to gold jewelry. But it was hard to take that. It was considered there was, I mean, it's not like there was no push for that. There was, it was wearing jewelry or excessive jewelry was considered bourgeois, right? There were couples that to show their, <laughs> their um, like dedication to the regime would marry without gold bands. So there was not like, it's not mm. that it went quietly but it was not illegal. Interesting. Yeah. It really, really interesting. So, um, so this was sort of like the distant past, <laughs> the less distant past. When I went to Bulgaria to college, I was on a full scholarship paid in dollars. And when I first got there, I noticed that the exchange rate between the dollar and the lev was about one to 50, 52 or so. $1.52 lev. And so for the next couple of years, uh, the exchange rate kept inching up to about $1 for 70 lev. I did not see a difference in my standard of living, obviously, but I did notice the exchange rate, right, creeping up. And it may sound like it's not so big, but I mean, it's like, what, 40% increase, right? Right. If so, they do that over a long period of time, it's not so noticeable. Like, exactly. you know, all of the fiat currencies have lost so much of their purchasing power value. So were you um, getting money to live on uh, in Bulgaria in dollars at that point? So you actually were probably better off then because you had very, dollars. I was very well off, but not quite. So I thought that was shielded from what happened afterwards. You wake up one morning and you find out the exchange rate is about a thousand <laughs> lev to one dollar. I'm sorry, yeah, a thousand lev to one dollar. Mm -hmm. And um, so you think, well, I'm in the money, right? <laughs> Dollars. Not quite. Really? Okay. Whenever, no, whenever these Interesting. big economic shifts happen, it's it's like a storm. It might not affect everyone the same way, but everyone does get affected. <laughs> and so, right. um, so the first thing that happened was because the, the, the exchange rate was changing like within hours, it made, I, I would lose money if I exchanged any, uh, anything bigger, like big, big bills. Any big bills were just not a smart move. So I was only exchanging like a dollar, five dollars at a time. Oh, well, that sounds like when I was in college, I was exchanging ten dollars <laughs> at a time, <laughs> taking ten dollars out of the bank. But yes, okay, go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, no, so yeah, I mean, it's not like normally I would exchange more, right. but 
I would exchange. So now I, I used to have like a budget for the week and I would exchange that money at the beginning of the week and then carry on. Right. That was just not possible anymore. So the trips to the exchange bureau were basically.